Welcome to the Personal Protection Podcast with your host, Lee Hasdell, at the Off-Grid Dojo in association with Critical Performance. Today, we have the pleasure to feature our special guest, Mr. Van Kay. We will be talking about close protection, judo, and everything else in between. Welcome to the Personal Protection Podcast, Van. How are you? Uh, I'm very good, thanks, mate. Thanks. Nice to be here. Yeah, okay. So today we're going to be talking about close protection, judo, and everything in between. So for the audience, do you want to give us a little bit of a background as to who you are, Yeah. what you do? Uh, Right. My name is Van. Um, I am, regarding judo, I'm a second dan in judo. I've been doing judo. uh, Well, I started when I was seven years old, believe it or not. And then sort of, you know, at seven years old, you know, really, you're not. You can't go there on your own, so you're at the mercy of your parents taking you, and there was a bit. So when I hit 15, sort of 14, that's when I got involved properly in martial arts, and I could take myself there. Um, so at 14, 15, I started doing Kyoko Shinkai Karate, and I, yeah. I went all the way up to uh, first first Q, and then um, and then started mixing judo in with that. And then sort of fell in love with judo and then continued on with judo up until second dan. And um, and that's pretty much my martial art history. Um, done a little bits of MMA here and there, but my main focus has been Kyokushin and, uh, and judo. Uh, uh, personally, or sort of uh, what I do work wise is I'm a close protection officer. Been doing that for years. Um, Got into sort of security and all that when I was around about sort of 25. Um, started off, believe it or not, bailiffing. And that was terrible. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was a horrible, horrible, uh, horrible thing to get into. Um, yeah. But that was my introduction to the sort of security side of things. Uh, from there, I went into sort of basic sort of security. Uh, done everything you can think of from doors on sort of pubs and strip clubs to uh, to um just sort of you know residential stuff uh, rst residential um corporate stuff uh stadiums you know sporting events all sorts of stuff and then sort of edged into close protection uh from there so it's been a nice sort of transition uh and i've pretty much covered everything within security uh and close protection yeah well i actually think for those that go into close protection it's better to have a background of various types of security because um, <clears throat> close protection is a very big uh, umbrella, very similar to personal protection. It's kind of a big umbrella, and you could find yourself in all kinds of places. So as an example, if you're doing close protection, you could actually find yourself in a nightclub or a casino mm-hmm. strip club. So yeah. having, a, having some knowledge of how security actually operates in those venues, to me, is a massive advantage, which, um, for instance, a lot of people also assume that if you're going to do close protection, it's better to have like a hostile military background, which for some instances it is, but for the most part, especially if, you, if you're working in, say, London or um, a, a major cosmoto- cosmopolitan capital, uh, it's better to have experience in the type of venues that you may be attending. Yeah, uh, I, so, yeah I agree 100%. Um, with me having a, a, you know, I remember when I was doing my CP course years ago, um, sitting around, a t- sort of sitting in a classroom with all the guys there. And they were sort of, you know, it's getting into the physical sort of, um, you know, signs, trigger signs, all that sort of stuff. If you've done doors, <laughs> you know how to read people, you sure. know. So I, I was saying to the guys there, look, you know, go and go and get a little job on the, in a bar or a club. Do the doors for a while. And you'll yeah. pick up on all the little sort of, you know, insignificant to most people but you'll pick up on all these subtle sort of subtle little sort of nuances that people have before it all sort of kicks off as it were so you can really learn how to read people doing other things other than sort of sterile close protection where yeah yeah, 100 you know so it's better to get get out there and sort of you know get your hands dirty as it were and, and sort of try other things before you go into close protection because a lot of the guys i remember 
I remember them uh, sitting around a table and discussing this and that. Some of them came from um, you know, military backgrounds and all that sort of stuff. Sure. And that's good if you're, if you're going into hostile uh, yeah. and you're going to continue out there. Um, but yeah, for Civvy Street, when you're walking, like you say, in clubs and bars, restaurants, all that sort of stuff, you, especially on Friday, Saturday night, you've got to be able to read people, see yeah. see who's doing what, you know, who the who the noisy sort of rowdy person is. You know, you've got to be able to read the crowd, as it were. And yeah. uh, and that is a skill that you can pick up only when you're working in that environment. So, yeah, get out there, do the doors first, you know, learn, learn your trade, as it were. Yeah, that's and what, what I think. What you'll find, and, and this is a bit of a top tip for anybody that's thinking of getting into close protection, is unless you're going to do the hostile stuff, mm. um, it's a good idea to get familiar with like five star lifestyle or high net worth oh, yeah. lifestyle. So mm. places like uh, ho- five star hotels, uh, casinos, even the nightclubs, yeah, yeah. horse racing, golf, shooting, um, skiing. To have a little bit of knowledge of those things. I mean, you don't have to be an expert in any of them, but to have the basics. Now, I remember I did my first close protection training in um, around about 1998, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And one of the modules was actually about how to have good etiquette at the dining table. Mm -hmm. Now, when I've told people about this in the close protection industry, a lot of them have laughed and sniggered at it. Well, from my personal experience, I would literally be at a dining table with a client nearly every day. Now, if Mm -hmm. you don't know the sort of uh, finer points of um, high net worth lifestyle, especially at the dining table, you could actually embarrass your client. And I actually, over the years, I found that that module where they taught you how to actually um, be at a dining table, five star or, or um, a high-end situation or scenario has actually gained me a lot of work because I've not I've never embarrassed the client in any way, shape, or form. Exactly. Uh, and you, you need to be able to blend in as well. You know, sure. you, you're not sort of standing there, you know, flexing your shoulders, you know, sticking your chest out. And all that sort of, you know, you, you have to be able to just blend in. You don't want to stick out like some sort of Neanderthal thug sort of in a yeah. suit, you know, who can't <laughs> picking up his food. You need to be able to blend in. You need to sure. be just, you know, undercover, as it were, you know, just completely covert, just blending in with the crowd. You don't want to be standing yeah. out. Yeah, and that's another thing with, because people always imagine that close protection, you're going to be sort of a six foot five, seven foot, um, 20 stone monster, Mm -hmm. which could be the case in some of the celebrity protection. But I've actually got good friends and colleagues that are around about maybe five foot five Mm -hmm. and very, you wouldn't notice them. Now, they actually work and do very well in close protection and i'll tell you like a se- sector that they work in they'll work in the city with say hedge funders mm-hmm. and bankers where they walk around in a pinstripe suit uh carrying a briefcase or or whatever yeah. Yeah. yeah and for instance myself i generally don't look like a banker so for me i've never really done that sort of work but mm-hmm. i know of a few guys who've done very very well albeit that they're five foot five and very unassuming they've kept employed for a long period of time specializing in that that area exactly it's, i mean the the sort of you can imagine the the hip-hop artist the rapper he wants six six foot ten mountains around him because it's yeah. it's just like wearing all the bling it's just an extension of all the bling um yeah. he wants to create an image surrounded by these big guys you know um but yeah like you say the guy in uh, up in up in canary wharf doesn't you know he just wants to low-key and at the end of the day, a, a good close protection officer has failed if he's fighting in the street and his in his uh, his yeah. um, his client is running down the road trying to get set. You know, it's it's all about just stopping stopping anything happening. You know, identifying yeah. what is going to or could happen or what is going to happen, and getting out of there before it even happens. You know, just getting to safety. Sure. You know, the last thing in the world you want to be doing is scrapping and fighting in the street as your as your principal runs off down the street. And, you yeah. know, that's that's a failure. That's a big failure as far as most uh, CPs are concerned. You know, you want to be able to identify any problems and just 
nullify them, get get out of there before they even happen. And your and your principal, he won't even know about it. You know, he won't sure. even know it, it yeah. was a, there was a threat there. You know, and that's that's the skill. You know, you don't want a big sort of fella sort of, you know, eyeing everyone up, sort of giving everyone sort of, you know, mean looks and all that. Yeah. That's intimidating people. That's that's not what, you know, that's where people get the idea of a bodyguard, you know, yeah. uh, some big sort of, you know, big lump of muscle just, you know, intimidating everyone around him. That's not a close protection officer. A close no. protection officer is using his head, looking around, identifying any problems, and um, and the, the, the principal doesn't even know there was a problem, you know. You just yeah. it's it's over before it even even began. Yeah, I, I always use a, yeah. yeah. I always use the term in, in in fact in all forms of protection and security is that you you're basically proving a negative. So yeah. your success is when absolutely nothing happens. <laughs> exactly. I say this to all my all my, anyone I work with. I say the last thing you want is me to be busy. <laughs> yeah. You don't want me being busy because if if me or the team I'm working with, if we're busy, then we're we're things aren't good. You know, yeah. you just want us there. You want us sort of dealing with things as they happen, but you don't want to know about it. You don't want us frantically sort of being busy. You really yeah. don't. You want us, you know, you want everything to seem calm and, and nice, you know, then yeah. you know you do. It's, it's a bit like using your car insurance every time you drive your car. You don't want to use your car <laughs> insurance every time you drive your car, you know. So it's the same with your security team. You don't want them busy. You know, yeah. you want them giving visual uh, deterrence and, and yeah. all that sort of stuff, being a visual deterrent if you need a visual deterrent. Uh, if yeah. not, then they're identifying problems and you won't even know they were there. You know, that's a good skilled team. You know, that really is, as far as yeah. I'm concerned. You know, you don't want to be using your security team constantly, that's for sure. Yeah, and I use the term personal protection as a means to enhance life liberty and freedom now this is something mm -hmm. that has to be factored in with, even with close protection because let's face it if we really wanted full protection then we wouldn't even leave the house we'd have a, a, a fortress we would have if we did go out we'd use a tank and we'd have an uh, apache helicopters um escorting <laughs> us and so on and so forth yeah now that is not necessarily the true meaning of close protection close protection is that you can create a, um, a boundary uh, mm -hmm. that offers life, liberty, and freedom for the client. And that's another area that I think a lot of people misunderstand when it comes to, and especially those new to the industry, that you have to have a certain demeanor of, demeanor of, of it, I call it tactical relaxation. So mm -hmm. although that you're ready to, to spring and pounce to action, you, you can't be on edge around your client because at the end of the day, potentially you could be with your client 24 hours a day. Yeah. And the last thing they want, especially if they're a performer <laughs> yeah. or they have to, or they're an artist or something like that, they don't want somebody that's on edge around them. And no, no. yeah. So with personal protection and close protection, there has, you have to factor in relaxation and downtime mm -hmm. and being able yeah. to switch off. Yeah. You, yeah. You need to keep it, low key keep the atmosphere nice everything you know you got to keep yep. yeah you got like i say you don't want to be on edge you don't want to be using your team or who or just your cp constantly you know you mm. want it to be nice and flow and yeah you don't want problems <laughs> you want to yep. you want to be able to relax and keep your uh, your principal very calm and yeah that's that's a good skill to have as part of the soft yep. skill set yeah yeah definitely yeah and I don't know what your training was like with regards to close protection, but there's, uh, I think for the most part, with the training, it's all about like preparation, recce's, triple mm -hmm. checking everything, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, boots on the ground with your client, you very rarely get the luxury, um, especially if you've got a client that wants to, it changes their mind, which often, quite often they do. You know, they change their mind at the last minute. I mean, I, I could name yeah. hundreds of, situations and stories where the client has just changed their mind at the last minute right. and if you're not suited to being able to think on your feet dynamic risk assessments things constantly mm -hmm. changing 
you're going to really have a hard time in, in something like close protection. Of course you are, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, a good, a good knowledge, say if you're going out in London and you've never been to London, that's going to cause, a, <laughs> you know, an issue. Um, but if you have a good knowledge of the area and, you know, the good, good areas and the bad areas and, you know, where the unsavory people might be hanging out, you can sort of guide them. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to be able to, like you say, think on, on your feet, on the fly and um, constantly risk assessing dynamic risk assessments just mm. as you said you're constantly looking you know everything changes all things change in a dynamic environment as they say yeah. and um yeah it's constantly changing and even if you do make plans and you do your recce's and all that stuff you go back when it's actually going live and uh and it's all changed anyway <laughs> so your plans are out the window you know it's a bit so like podcasting to to, yeah you have to be able to yeah Plan, you know, plan to fail, fail to plan, or what, you know, but you have to be able to adapt and yeah. overcome any little situation that, that pops up, as it were. Yeah. yeah okay. I've got a few questions I ask the guests, and um, I don't ask all of them, but there's a few. Uh, one of them is personal protection in the future. Now, this can incorporate close protection, um, but protect, protection in general in the future so i mean do you anticipate or have you experienced like within the last 18 months we, we're all aware of the um societal changes and um everybody's had to adapt and, and literally pivot what they're doing whether it's business uh family lifestyle occupation so on and so forth um but from a protection perspective do you predict mm -hmm. there's going to be any, any major changes in the future uh, I mean, we can see it already uh, with, um, you know, cyber, cyber crime, sort of online yeah. crime that, that's going through the roof. You know, cyber crime analysts uh, are very well paid now at the minute. Uh, so protecting people's identities and, and whatnot online is obviously mm. where it's really going. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, we've had what, a year and a half of lockdown. Everything is changing. I mean, uh, the a lot of the criminals are quite literally going hungry now. So the yeah. crime is getting more bold. You know, we're yeah. seeing lots of robberies in the streets and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. People having their front doors kicked in while they're at home and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, yeah I mean, they are getting bolder, lots of more carjackings and motorbikes being stolen at, at lights, you know, traffic lights and all that sort yeah. of stuff. So things have ramped up a bit and obviously certain uh, external environmental sort of reasons behind that as well some cultures have more um violence in them you know so when i was growing up you never heard of uh, a machete attack or an acid attack but obviously yep. culturally these are these are sort of elements of some some cultures and obviously as we integrate those cultures into our culture that's where we see this rise in sort of quite horrific um, violence, which is machete attacks in broad daylight on the streets, acid attacks and all that sort of stuff. So it is, everything is changing as we move forward and, and the world gets smaller um, and the cultures start to sort of integrate, then obviously the good parts integrate, but also the bad parts as well. And that's why we're yeah. seeing things really change on the street. You know? Well, one of, the, one of the things that is key to, personal protection and close protection is that you have to be realistic now because of say political correctness i think unfortunately that leaves a, sometimes a bit of a, a big gap because people won't necessarily look at certain aspects um of, of societal change so as an example um maybe a couple of years ago i actually did a task in central london and one of the main threats was the acid attacks Mm -hmm. So we had to adapt. So we all carried water. We actually all carried eye protection. Yeah. Uh, now that's something that we never really done before prior to say two years ago. So in our everyday carry, we'd have bottles of water, eye protection, and even for the dogs, because we were using dogs yeah. because um, the gangs, they weren't scared of the police. They weren't scared of security. They weren't scared of street wardens. The only thing that the only two things they were scared of was potentially was immigration and um, dogs. Yeah. So it was a new initiative, and we brought the dogs uh, into the game, and that was a big game changer because uh, they didn't come anywhere near us. 
But mm-hmm. the point I'm trying to make is that we had to start carrying as everyday carry eye protection water. Yeah. Because yeah, what the exactly. gangs were doing, they would approach you and they'd have a, a cup like this. And we didn't know if it was water or acid, but they'd stand there mm-hmm. looking at you. So this um, could have been a gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the weapon of choice for them was a cup with liquid in, uh, yeah. under the assumption that it's acid. Now, you don't really want to find out. And it's a yeah. definite threat. So what they're doing is they're walking up to clients and... Um, basically demanding their watches, shoes, iPhones, yep. so on and so forth. And um, the threat was acid, or it could have been water, but nobody really wanted to find out. Yeah, yeah, you didn't want to test it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. yeah it, that's, that's how it's changed, you know, it really has. And like you were saying, unless you want to lock yourself in, in your in your fortress, you're going to be outside, you're going to be getting out of your cars and all that sort of stuff. And that's where things can things have changed and you're you're being carjacked and all sorts of stuff you're having like you say your phones and mobile phones and watches taken off you everything and yeah someone wielding a machete or or a little bit of liquid in a cup you just don't know but the game yeah. has changed you know yeah. it really has so um so that's yeah so, so let, let's let's link up close protection and judo now for those who don't know, I'm a big fan of judo. I actually practiced judo in 1996 for two years. And I've, whenever I've been working away and I've seen a judo club uh, locally, I've always popped in. I always make sure I take, take my uh, training gi with me. And um, whether it's Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, sambo, um, or um, judo, or ju- jiu-jitsu, uh, if there's a local club, I'll often pop in and get a bit of a workout because... Um, you'll know about this when you're working away especially in close protection or any type of security training can go down the pan very quickly if you're not yeah. careful <laughs> yes, can, yeah. Yeah. so yeah for those who don't know i'm a big fan of judo and there's a number of reasons why i'm a big fan of judo and i'm sure you'll you'll agree and probably go into into a greater detail than myself when it comes to doing security and um, especially close protection you can't really be punching the bad people um, no. because a lot of cross protection is centered around the media. And even without the media, everybody's got a smartphone. You've got CCTV everywhere. And if you're not careful, you could get yourself into a lot of trouble or you could get booted off of a task because you've injured yeah. a, a journalist or a paparazzi or something. So judo yeah. to me is, is the perfect, I mean, the, the meaning of judo is that they call it like the, the gentle art or yeah. Yeah, flexible way. yeah the gentle way yeah um so for me that's perfect for close protection unlike boxing kickboxing even mma could be a bit unpractical for very sensitive situations exactly yeah um yeah i mean uh, judo is yeah it's like you said it's called the gentle way and uh and i've i've you know, I've been a, a lifelong martial art fan, you know, watching Bruce Lee films when I was a kid, everything. Yeah, Bruce Lee on my wall as opposed. I've been a lifelong martial art fan. All the ninja films and Van Damme yeah. films, Chuck Norris, you name it. Um, but, and I've, I've, I've done full contact karate and, and all sorts of things, you know, MMA, mix things up a bit, all sorts of things. But judo, without doubt, is the most subtle but effective Yep. thing i can use in my occupation without doubt without doubt sure. um like like you say um cameras everywhere everyone's got a smartphone if you're you know and what most of the time you can't hear what's being said so this person who's in your face or or trying to get to your principal or whatever could be antagonizing saying you saying some absolutely terrible things to you um and if you start you know, and maybe even pushing you or something like that. All the camera sees is him push you. Yeah. And if you're doing, you know, do some sort of boxing or something, and then you, you sock him with a right hook, you're, that's disproportionate force. Sure. You know, he pushed you. Okay, you could call it a preemptive strike or something like that, but you'd have <laughs> to then prove that. You know, you'd yeah, you'd have to prove. 
Um, but all the camera, and if there was a jury, all they'd see was, well, he gave you a little push and then you knocked him out with a, a right cross. Yeah? yeah. So that's probably not the best situation. And then from there, you could lose your license, you could lose your job, you can lose everything from that point. Well, if, if, um, you're working, if you're working for a uh, um, celebrity, that would make yeah. front, front page headlines. Yeah. yeah. That would and, go viral. <laughs> yeah. 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 Everybody wants that video of a bodyguard punching somebody. And you go on Facebook. Yeah. You yeah. go on Facebook. You know, you see all these videos coming up of, of yeah. security, out, of, sorry, bouncers or, or doormen punching people, knocking them out, strangling them. You know, they don't keep their license for long. That's for sure. You know, yeah. uh, I was watching one the other just yesterday or a day before. Uh, Poundland, the uh, staff in Poundland grabbed this blue like a, a, a shoplifter, dragged him out, his trousers around his ankles, and one of the the guys done like a, a, a karate kick on him, like a like a karate kid kick, you know, yeah. the uh, like a <laughs> the, cra- the crane <laughs> like a one, double, yeah, like a crane kick on him, <laughs> kicked him into the street. He's going to go to court for that, you know. It, you know, it doesn't matter what this guy's been doing or saying in the show. That was excessive force. You probably do time you know, for that. There was no, there was no immediate that? threat. He's just yeah. done a you know a kung fu kick on him and dropped this guy to the pavement, and he's probably going to go to you know he's going to go to court for it for sure. Yeah. He's looking at That's, doing time, uh, I reckon, <clears throat> for a kick. Quite possibly, quite yeah. possibly, because there was no immediate threat. They had him out of the shop, and this wasn't even a security operative. You know, this is this is just one of the Poundland staff. You know, who's really? been watching too many Bruce Lee films. Yeah, so I yeah. mean, everyone is recording everything and that's how you have to think so if you're in a situation where you're protecting your principal or you're working on a door or whatever and you've got some guy threatening you or whatever you've got to be really careful because at that point the cameras come out the phones come out and you're being recorded you know so again if you're bouncing around on your toes sort of you know jabbing towards him and trying to punch him or trying to roundhouse kick him in the head yeah you're the one who's going to come off worse in the long term, you're going to lose your license for, for a bad and you will lose your yeah, license. Yeah, and, and also, and this is a point that's been raised many times, that the moment, it, by definition, that you hold, a, say, a close protection license or even door supervisor mm-hmm. license, that means that you should know better and you'll be oh, held yeah, you in, in higher with higher accountability than, a, than yeah. the criminal or the perpetrator. You've been trained, you've been taught, you've been taught what's reasonable force. You've done your uh, your PI, your physical intervention training. They've shown you what's acceptable, what's not. So if you start punching and kicking people in the head, then you're yeah. probably going to have some problems after that. You know, so, yeah, that's where judo is so subtle, so yeah. subtle. You know, if, if it's cold and it's nighttime, they've got a nice big jacket on, they start pushing you, all this sort of stuff. The camera sees them pushing you. And yeah. then at that point, all you do is maybe sidestep. And as they yeah. push, you pull. <laughs> as they push towards you, you sidestep. And it's it's called uh, kazushi, yeah. balance break. It's yeah. the most important thing in judo. Yeah. When you're doing judo in a in a dojo, um, you want to feel the uh, the best way to describe it is in an empty jacket. There was a famous book written by I can't remember who wrote it. Wrote it. Um, it was called Empty Jacket. Sure. And you want to. F- if you're fighting with someone who's an experienced judoka, it will feel like there's no one in their jacket. Yeah, just, call, you won't feel I, any. Yeah, I yeah, call this so. invisibility. Yeah. Yeah. So when when we're doing jujitsu, um, even on the ground, mm. you become almost invisible to your opponent, so they can't sense yeah. what the direction, the the yeah. the forces, um, push pull actions, and so on and so forth. It's a very yeah, you know, subtle lie. Yeah. It takes yeah. takes a while to to pick it up, but you will actually learn it quite quickly when, when you're on the mats. You, you, have, oh, yeah. when, you have to learn it. <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm doing Niwaza, which is the groundwork side of juji, uh, judo, um, yeah, I, I just, I let the, you know, the guys on top of me, I just, I relax, I close my yeah. eyes, and I'm just feeling for what he's doing. And then wherever he's going, I'll go with him. And, you sure. know, you, and you're looking for your openings. And it's the same yeah. when you're standing up. If they're pushing you, then you go with them. You, you just turn and, and they're, they're, mm. they're on their back, you know, quite literally within seconds with their own force. Yeah. You know? Now, what? So, yeah, sorry, Karen. No, no, I was going to say, and that's what the uh, the camera would see. So they'd yeah. see this ag- aggressor, 
you being passive, he pushed you and then fell over quite literally. Mm. And no one, and it's so subtle, sure, they wouldn't even know why or how it happened. <laughs> you know, yeah. just you, okay, he pushed you and fell over, he must be drunk, you know. Yeah. So, and yeah. what one of the things or of many that I love about judo it, it's it's very much throw orientated, although you have mm. new, there was a groundwork, but it's very much uh, and mainly because of the rule set, it's mainly mm. a throwing art. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah. 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 For me, that is insecurity or protection mm-hmm. is one of the most important things because if you're even just from a personal preservation aspect, but let's say if you're doing close protection, you're going to be under the media spotlight. The last thing you want to happen is for you to end up on your backside. Yeah. Um, you want obviously uh, to be able to disengage and get your client away from the threat. Uh, yeah. What would be really um, the opposite to that is that you end up on your backside uh, yeah. where you can't really do anything. You can't protect your client. You can't protect yourself. <clears throat> yeah. And if you're yeah. on the floor in, in some sort of street fight situation where well, you probably got a couple of his friends trying to kick you in the head as well, you know, so yeah. the floor is the last place you want to be in a Brazilian yeah. jiu-jitsu tournament. You might want to go to the floor and you see the guys. It's, it, it, it's not my favorite thing to see where you've got two guys standing and then one drops onto their sure. backside. Yeah. and pulls the other one onto that isn't what you want in a real life no. situation um that's the last thing you'd want especially yeah. with five guys standing around you taking taking turns to kick you <laughs> you know mm. so uh, yeah being but, able to grapple and and sort of wrestle and being able to just manipulate with judo you're you've got someone of equal size usually and um and you're you know, you're, you're moving that body around and to be able to move that body around effectively, yeah. another person of equal size, that is a skill. And that's where the, the, the Kazushi comes in, the, the balance sure. breaking, being able to move them and disengage, as you said. And uh, that is a valuable skill. It really is sure. a very valuable, practical skill. Yeah, there's a thing. I, I This is my personal thing. I call it the dark mm-hmm. side of judo. Now, mm-hmm. what the, what. A, what I'm alluding to is judo over the years, it's become an Olympic sport where you've got rules, regulations, so on and so forth. And it's pretty much kind of steered a lot of the training. Uh, you still get a few like old school judokas that will practice the techniques that are now not allowed. Now yeah. you'll be able to explain this probably better than myself. When I, when I say the dark side of judo, in my opinion, judo is one of the most effective forms of self-defense uh, that there is. And, one of the main reasons is because wherever you are, you've got the floor. For the most mm-hmm. part, it's going to be concrete or marble mm-hmm. or whatever else. To me, potentially, that is a type of weapon. So oh, everybody's, yeah. everybody's carrying a weapon. Now, with judo, because uh, the skill is in the takedown or the throw or the unbalancing, like you say, mm-hmm. um, the impact of hitting the floor can actually be fatal and very effective. So... If you, if you want to talk yeah. about that, um, the judo before it was Olympic sport. Yeah, the uh, it was it was they've taken all the all the good stuff out now. They've taken <laughs> all the leg, all the all the horrible sort of leg breaking <laughs> leg yeah. and, and uh, vicious sort of neck cranks. They've all been taken out now. Um, but even though it is an Olympic sport, the ippon is known as a symbolic death. That's yeah. that's what the that's what it's known as. Um, and if you think about it, why, why it's a symbolic there, um, is because you're the key to an ippon. That's the big score that ends the match is to land them cleanly with force on their back. Yeah. Now, if you uh, if you don't know how to break for and you're being thrown with force onto the concrete floor yeah. and you don't know how to break for your head's going to bounce off that. And that's why they call it a symbolic death, because sure. in the street situation on concrete, it probably will be a death. At least a coma. If you, yeah, a coma. It's gonna, it's gonna really not be good for the person. That's for sure. So yeah. it's known as a symbolic death, um, and that is, again, you don't want to be seen throwing people onto their back into the street. But again, if you're in that sort of situation and it's and they're pushing you and they happen to be sort of you know launch themselves or onto their back, yeah. then uh, yeah, it's it's not going to be good. So yeah, it's known as a symbolic death. The epon is a symbolic death, yeah. uh, and it always yeah. Um, what was I going to say? I've lost my train of thought. 
um, yeah, they've taken all the good the good stuff or the dark stuff yeah. out of it. You know? um, and it's actually funny because for the last few months, I've been looking more into the dark side of it as well. Uh, <laughs> all those leg, leg breaks and, you know, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, even leg grabs, they've taken leg grabs out of sure. judo, Olympic judo. So again, you can't, you know, grabbing someone's legs and sort of launching them <laughs> yeah. is a one. I used to love doing that, you know, yeah. uh, like a proper old school rugby tackle, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, all of those forbidden in randori, for, you know, forbidden in um, contest, all those, uh, they shouldn't be lost. They shouldn't be lost. They should, they should still be trained, I think. Yeah. But just not used in competition or randori, but they should still yeah. be trained. Well, because at, otherwise you're going to lose them. Yeah. Yeah. At the judo club I trained at in 1996, uh, I used to get told off all the time because for the most part, I was always using some of the uh, sambo or wrestling techniques mm-hmm. that I'd been training yeah. prior to that. Uh, most of them are, uh, are illegal under sport judo, but the club, they actually had a self-defense section. Um, they, they kind of termed it self-defense judo or combat judo, where they would actually train some of these um, techniques that have been taken away. And I think it's probably useful, depending on what, what the aim is of the judo club, because if you're an Olympic judo school, you probably don't really want to waste training time on the illegal techniques. You want to focus on winning a gold medal at the next Olympics. But for your average judo club, um, I don't really know how many of them retain a self-defense section uh yeah not not many i mean it's more sport and recreation judo now um but me i'm a i'm a you know traditionalist i don't i don't like the idea of old techniques just being lost to time i like to sure even if you're not going to use them in competition at least keep them there because eventually they won't be remembered and you'll forget you know the the fundamentals and basics and the and those all those techniques will be gone forever. So yeah. I'm a big, yeah, I'm a traditionist. I like to keep, even though you're not using them, it's nice to keep, you know, like an antique, you know, just keep it on yeah. the side there and, and admire them. Uh, well, that, I like it, this nicely leads me to one of the questions of the podcast. And that is Katana versus the Shinai, mm-hmm. which if you look at behind me, I've got um, a Katana here and a Shinai at the bottom here. Now that symbolizes the reality combat of the live blade of the Shinai uh, versus mm-hmm. the combat sports, sorry, of the, of the Katana and the combat sports side of the Shinai. Now with judo, they've taken away, say some of the Katana techniques, which mm-hmm. are deadly and um, which facilitates more of the, the Shinai play softer techniques. But the consequence of that is that it actually makes judo tougher in some ways because you have to engage for longer so conditioning Mm -hmm. wise it almost makes for a tougher workout so uh what's your sort of views on the sport side versus reality side yeah live real real life training you know sort of situations rather than uh, or or just recreational sort of fitness training um both if you can incorporate both i think that's that's the yeah. best of both worlds um yeah. obviously you mentioned you get more more of a workout when you're doing the sport side of it but yeah. really really depends on the individual as well i mean if for me personally i want to see a practical side to those to those techniques i want to sure. i want to be able to make sure they work if i need them certainly in my career uh, yeah. in my job um yeah you you don't want to be uh practicing these techniques and then find out the hard way that they don't work so you want sure. you want some practical uh evaluation of them without doubt um yeah. but obviously you want to you know enjoy it and be recreate you know enjoy the recreational side and the fitness aspects of it um but yeah you, there's no point just yeah it's it's like uh, when i did um karate for years um the kata side yeah it's very nice and it's great to, again, it's tradition, but again, I was more into the, the fighting side, you know, getting yeah. stuck in, have, doing some sparring and all that sort of stuff. Um, whereas the kata side, as nice as it is, and it teaches you all the, you know, the, the techniques in their purest form, uh, again, it didn't really 
unless that kata was being done with a, an uki, an opponent, yeah. uh, to show you that, you know, you're actually blocking a punch and all that stuff. I sort of tended to go to, towards the sparring side. So, again, yeah. it's uh, more on the individual rather than anything. But me personally, I want to see that those techniques work. So, sports side, yes. Um, so, the uh, the shinai, yes. Uh, yeah. But So, a shinai in one hand and a katana in the other. <laughs> 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 yeah, one. I'll remember that one. That's a good expression. <laughs> one in each hand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I believe it was. I'm trying to think whether Musashi, the famous swordsman, whether he he used a wooden um, barge pole in a fight or something um, okay. instead of a katana, and he actually won it. So that's, that's probably a good analogy or example of of being flexible enough to better switch from one to the other. Um, yeah, that's, that's very, very interesting. So, with judo being an Olympic sport, most of the focus of judo now is on winning the Olympic gold medal. Yeah. Which probably yeah. kind of narrows, narrows it right down quite a bit. But um, people like yourself and many other um, judo practitioners that are involved in security, I think they will use the skills that they've got from training in judo because it's not necessarily particular grips or uh, throws or takedowns that are needed. It can also be the uh, situational awareness or the, the pressure of, of somebody because depending on the, the type of close protection, if you're working say in, in um, celebrity protection or media uh, environments where there's lots of people pushing, shoving. And one of the key things is that the client needs to be, in public, they, they can't be tucked away. They need to be in close contact, maybe doing autograph signing, even photo opportunities. There is going to be a lot of uh, pushing and shoving. Mm -hmm. And with judo, you get used to pressure, sensitivity, um, also breaking grips uh, from yourself or from the client even. Um, because a lot, of, a lot of people say, well, in close protection, nobody will ever get close to your client. Well, what if, yeah, you've heard that one before, yeah? Um, yeah. What if it your makes client... Me think of, makes me think of when Arnold Schwarzenegger was in, uh, he was doing a, well, he was in South Africa, and out That's of it, nowhere, yeah. this guy came running over and kicked yeah. him in the back. And, was yeah. like, and his, uh, his team was standing around him, sort of looking at each other, like, what just happened? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just never know what's going to happen. So no. to be able to um, control that person's body weight and get them out of the way, if you saw it happening, I mean, you yeah. can never plan for everything, but uh, I mean, that was quite yeah. a freak, a freak occurrence, but yeah. yeah, but they got to him, you know, they got yeah. to him. Yeah. And you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger was actually in a public place, uh, surrounded by mm. people. There's lots, lots of hustle and bustle, things like that, which mm. is very common. You know, even if your client wants to go on a shopping trip, you know, mm. they go to, um, um, central London and walking down the street, so on and so forth. Um, for the most part, they actually want to be. It's in, it's in their business interest to have people take photos of them being seen out oh, yeah, shopping, yeah. leaving a hotel, yeah, yeah. going into a restaurant, yeah, yeah. coming out yeah. the gym. Yeah, so so yeah. You, it's a real double-edged sword with close protection, and, and this is where I think a lot of close protection or um, people that are thinking about doing close protection, there's a lot of misconceptions because they kind of figure that it's. Um, all or nothing type thing. When in actual yeah. fact, there's such a grey area with protecting the client. Because remember, it's about uh, life, liberty and freedom for the client. And they have to make money uh, or else they can't pay you. And their way of making money is to be in the media spotlight. Uh, and like I say, this is a very uh, difficult area for the close protection officer to manage. Yeah, again, I, I think it really... Um... Again, I think martial art play a lot into it. Martial arts play a lot into this. It's having that martial mind, believe it or not. It's like you say, you yeah. know, business, anything. It's it's looking at life in a certain way, looking at situations in a certain way. You know, you don't mm. want to be, it's that warrior in the garden, um, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You don't, you want to, you want to have or peace through superior firepower is, is what I like to say as well. Yeah. Um, you want to be able to have everything there to deal with every situation, but you don't want to 
deal with that situation. You hope yeah. that situation will never arise. And if it does, then then you have to adapt and, and deal with it the best you can. But yeah, ultimately you want your client to be able to go shopping and you don't want to impend on his or her, you know, you don't want to impose on his life. You don't want to no. lock him away. You know, you don't want to protect him over protect him, you know, all that sort of stuff. Sure. He has to be able to live his life normally and you yeah. don't want to be there, you know, like a big dark shadow looming yeah. in the background. He has to be able to live his life or her life just normally and like I said originally, you don't want your security to be used. You don't want it to be, but it is there sure. if needed, you know? Yeah. And that's it. That's the key, really. It's getting that balance between protection, but also liberty and, and freedom yeah. to, to live your life as, as free as you can. It's like a physical a insurance policy. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And um, that's all it is. That's, that's all security is. It is. It's an insurance policy. You don't want to be using your insurance constantly when you're driving your car because that's that's not good. Uh, yeah. You want it there in case, just in case. You know. So yeah. it is. It's an insurance policy, and you want to be able to rely on that insurance policy uh, yeah. should you need it. You know. Um, I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but it, it, it's relatively common that even the client doesn't want close protection but say the um, management or the uh, talent management company they insist on it or it could be that they're wearing particular jewelry that has mm. um, been lent to them or given to them um, as a gift and they actually they will pay, pay they'll pay for the protection the client doesn't actually want it in many cases that's the worst type of client to work for I've had, I've, I've, I've experienced that as, uh, in many, many areas of security. You know, they, you're just, you're just annoying. <laughs> the, the fact that you have to go with them everywhere and, and, yeah. uh, and you're there and you, you know, you're, you're stopping pe their friends from seeing them uh, because you're, you're asking who are you and, have you, you know, yeah. it's, it's an annoyance to some people. They really don't. It's, it's an unnecessary annoyance, but yeah. It's an unnecessary an annoyance uh, until they need it, you know, and then you're yeah. the best thing in the world, you know. So uh, I've had that happen as well, where they, they really don't want you there. They don't want you around. You're a pain in the ass to them. Mm. Uh, and then something happens and they were glad you were there, you know, and yeah. they, they sort of, and you see that turn in them as well, that switch in them where they hated you before, but now you're good friends, you know, and they like you. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen that happen as well. So, or I've seen is, that happen, that happen. is it fair to say that there's a definite link up between judo or the martial arts, close protection and personal protection? So, instead of you looking after a client, you apply the same principles to looking after yourself and your own family. So, you become Constant. your own bodyguard or the bodyguard of your own family. Yeah, yeah. Even even my uh, yeah my my partner, she's going out and. I'm, I'm saying, right, don't use your phone in the street. If you are using your phone in the street, put your back against the wall. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm constantly telling you, you know, uh, thinking for, you know, just be careful. If you see any scooters going past, you know, put your phone away. Have your phone, uh, your bag across you and all this. Or, you know, just yeah. constantly, you know, keeping her on her toes as so she doesn't she doesn't become a victim to mm. some idiot on the street. Um, but, yeah, constantly. I mean, uh, it's you can't turn it off. You can't turn it off. You're constantly doing uh, risk assessments when you're going into a restaurant or a bar or a pub <laughs> or whatever. You know, you're sitting with your back against the wall. You're looking at the exits. You're looking for your exits. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's ridiculous. And um, you can't turn it off. You can't turn it off. Um, but it's a good thing you can't turn it off because yeah. some people don't think like that. They don't, they're not sort of tactically aware, if you want to call it that. They don't sure. think. Like, they just go through life thinking nothing i i used to do uh cp with this guy and we'd we'd um we'd have to sit in a in a in a coffee shop opposite where we were looking after yep. and um and it was up in london it was up just near regent street and we were looking at it was a it was a guy's shop actually it was a premises yep. um and we were just sitting outside and he'd had a few sort of people you know trying to get in there and what so uh, yep. you had to ring the bell again anyway so we were always stationed across the road in a coffee shop and we just sat there drinking coffee all day pretty much but it allowed us to analyze and people watch you know just see yeah, yeah. And, and you'd see how oblivious the average person is mm. when they're walking down the street when they're having a coffee and they got their phone and they're smoking a cigarette 
yeah. they are and it, and it really is it's like they are prey to the predators yeah you know you know you know one of these guys could just like a little gazelle walking off and all of a sudden he's surrounded by a pride of lions that are going to tear him to pieces yeah it really is you can see the predators and the prey you yeah. can see the guys who are up to no good uh you can see the ones that are out sort of pickpocketing and all that sort of stuff and then you see the guys that are just passively smoking looking at their phone and and you just start to identify who's the prey and there's lots of prey and who are the yeah. predators and yeah. you can just sit back and you can see and um and it really does i mean it, it really a lot of people are just so oblivious to what's going on around them and how easy yeah. one wrong turn would put them in in real you know change their life for the worst you know they walk down the wrong road at the wrong time something bad would happen to them you know yeah. and they're just oblivious to it they're completely oblivious well the, yeah. the average person has far more power uh, over their personal protection than they realize like the power is in mm. their self-awareness or spatial yeah. awareness and being yeah, able yeah. to observe um i remember years ago in the 90s i got privy to a lot of research they did on crime in um, luxury hotels mm. now they said you know we can beef up the security we can do all these things but with all the stats and everything they realized that the hotels that had the least amount of crime were the ones that had reception staff, be it concierge, cleaners, um, um, hospitality, uh, the car parking team, were the ones that made eye contact with everybody that walked in. Yeah, uh, That was a yeah. major deterrent. Now, the, the, the venues or hotels that had the most amount of crime were the ones where somebody could walk in through reception and not one person would look at them. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Even the ability, the old... yeah. So, so having people around you that are aware and looking, paying attention, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be that you're staring at somebody. You can actually camouflage it by saying, like, uh, "Good morning, sir," or "Good morning, yeah. madam." Yeah, just uh, acknowledge can we help them. You? And, yeah. yeah, yeah, acknowledge them, and then all of a sudden they know they're on the radar. You know, yeah. they know they've been seen, they've yeah. been acknowledged. They haven't just snuck in and and gone past. Yeah, yeah, I, I can, uh, yeah, I can understand how that. Yeah. that works without so, doubt so um for those people that spend their life i call it wider sleep so when they're walking down mm -hmm. the street obviously they're awake but they're wider asleep, mm -hmm. either on their phone right. distracted uh even headphones uh headphones is a big one because you can't hear anything you're listening to loud music you can't hear uh, and your senses are your peripheral vision is, is is closed down so you're very um you're not likely to spot any any abnormalities which is another thing which is I, I in my opinion in close protection this is one of the major skills that you will learn in fact in any security uh, even security dogs right mm -hmm. the way a security dog does they scan the environment then when they scan it back again if there's any changes in what they see it mm -hmm. spikes their attention yeah so a lot of people don't realize this this is how this is the difference between a guard dog and a pet dog well, in fact, most dogs have it to a degree, but a, a, a protection dog can scan an environment, scan it back, scan it back. And if they spot a difference, that's why it, I don't know how experienced you are with dogs. But for instance, if you've got your dog in your room and even cats do this and you put a chair or you move a bit of furniture, they become fascinated. And mm -hmm. the reason is because there's been a change or there's a, in a, an abnormality in their environment and they become interested in it. So yeah. personal protection, close protection, in fact, all security, you're looking for abnormalities. And yeah, that could be 100%. people's behavior. It could be different people. Um, and this is a major skill, which it can be taught and you can exercise it, but you tend to get it from experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah, even, even suspicious people packages and all that sort of stuff if you're walking yeah. you know open windows you know uh fire escapes that are open you know you just gotta they, things that aren't normal but yeah. again it's it's becoming aware of those things uh, you know because people are oblivious to everything you know yeah. like you say they're just looking down at their phone they're, they're blocking off you know they got their headphones in they're blocking off two of their main senses yeah. and um <laughs> and they're oblivious absolutely oblivious 
Yeah, it could be uh, some suspect package next to him. You know, he could be standing next to it, drinking his latte, you know, or yeah. whatever. They're oblivious. Whereas yeah. if you've been trained and you live in that sort of world, then you're looking for open fire escapes. You're looking for suspicious yeah. people hanging around with their hoods up and their face covered um, sort of in a doorway. You're looking mm. for these things, you know. Um, and again, I think, I don't know, people really... I think there should be some sort of education on this uh, to, to make take people from being prey into s- sort of more aware, at least, you know, they're never going to become uh, predators or equalizers, as it were. But yeah, uh, well, a lot of, of a, a lot of this. Sense. Yeah, a lot of this stuff was investigated and researched with the uh, Combat Hunter Project uh, mm-hmm. or program, which was the U.S. Marines. They wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, get down the amount of casualties that they were receiving whilst they're in hostile environments. And one of the main things they identified was that if you've got the mindset of being prey mm-hmm. because you're in a hostile environment and you're not in your comfortable environment, then you will probably become prey as opposed to yeah. becoming the predator. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I call it like active paying attention. So yeah. you become like a predator. Uh, yeah. So once again, when you're scanning your environment, and your environment could be that you're sat in the middle of nowhere or you're in a, a nice um, mansion or sit, sat in the car park of a mansion or whatever, right through to walking through Harrods mm-hmm. or, or any high net worth shop in central London, you're scanning. You're actually kind of hunting. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, you just made me think of uh, a lot. some of the security companies that install... Um, CCTV and all that stuff. They actually yeah. hire ex-criminals. Okay. They hire ex-criminals yeah. to say, right, what do you think? Where are the weak spots? Because yeah. they're not thinking how to protect. They're thinking how to attack. Get in. Yeah. How to attack. Yeah. And um, I think that that's again that probably. Um, sorry, my phone is going off. Sorry. Um, that probably um, comes down to that whole martial mind. I call it a martial mind of, of thinking more like a predator would think yep. rather than, you know, it's because there's a hierarchy and wherever we are, you know, our minds create hierarchies. Where do you want to be? You want to be at the top of the food chain or the bottom, you know, that's yep. it. Um, so yeah, you have to think like you're at the top of the food chain. I think, you know, think more like a predator rather than prey because you're yep. going to be one of them, you know, where do you want to fit in? <laughs> you know, you're either, hunted, you're either hunted or you're the hunter. What do you want to be? You know, so yeah. I'd personally, I'd like to be at the top rather than the bottom, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is where I think martial arts come in. Um, because I think as people, we all like to sort of test ourselves anyway, know our strengths and our weaknesses. And we need to know how we're going to react in certain situations. And that's where, again, martial arts and building what I call the martial mind, that warrior sort of mind. That's where martial arts really come in because they do show you what you can endure physically and mentally and emotionally. So it will, especially if you take that into a more combat orientated martial art, such as judo or something like that. Uh, Judo, you can have a really good hard scrap um, and and you're going to be fine. You're not going to get injured bar some freak accident um so you can really push yourself you know like i say physically mentally and emotionally Mm. um and there's not many things especially in today's sanitized world where you're still allowed to do that maybe some sports such as rugby and all that sort of stuff where where it's a bit more physical but martial arts will really teach you to your limits it will teach you your limits and you only know where your limits are when you hit them and exceed them and you say, yeah. I can't do any more. Yeah. I'm physically, emotionally, or, um, you know, psychologically wrecked. I can't do any more. So that's why I think martial arts, especially combat martial arts, where you're actually, you know, physically training with other people and fighting, sparring, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. That's where their importance really, really lies, you know, because it, well, it teaches you your limits. Yeah. Something that I yeah. always find with, judo um and this includes not so much wrestling but um let's say russian sambo which is very similar to judo Mm -hmm. that one slight change 
of grip or position will change everything. Oh, yeah. And being able to pick up on it uh, or predict it or sense it, sense that change in balance, position, in posture, um, it makes you very <clears throat> sensitive to change and being able to adapt with it. And this trains the mind to be in connection yeah. with the body and a visual, because, you know, you can visually see if somebody's about to do uh, uchi mata or mm -hmm. something, or even if you can, and, and this is another thing, you may not be able to see the, the, the footwork or the feet, okay, but you instinctively mm -hmm. know just by even yeah, the movement can, of the shoulders that their feet, it, yeah. Yeah, their feet have changed position. And this is a skill that you can't really buy. No, uh, you can't it give it away. Learned, yeah. learned and practiced and earned yeah. almost. Uh, even, even concentration. You know, I yeah. can think of two occasions recently where I've been doing randori, which is fighting, and I've lost concentration. And then... I'm on my backside, you know, I've been thrown. <laughs> yeah. Just instantly, I've lost concentration. Someone caught my eye and I'm, I'm, I'm now on the floor, you know, lying, looking at yeah. the ceiling. So again, it, it teaches it. Sorry. Uh, it, it, sh yeah, it teaches concentration, strengthens your mind and everything. It really, it, it benefits you in, in so many different ways, you know? So yeah, yeah. if you've got kids, start them in martial arts, get them, get them training <laughs> as soon as you can, you know, because yeah. it'll make, we're going to make little warriors out of them, uh, which is important, <laughs> I think, especially in this sort of world where where everything's so sanitized. Well, you know. there, there is a narrative, and I, I believe it's a, it's a real threat, is that they're trying to encourage the lack of awareness. They want to put mm. everything into a small screen. Uh, I, I spent around about five, six years teaching kids martial arts, and one of the first lessons I had to teach the kids was to be able to stand up without looking down at their, yeah. their phones because some of them have had phones since the age of three. And yeah, it terrible. really shuts down their, their spatial awareness and their observation mm -hmm. skills. So yeah. I would spend quite a bit of time with them working on uh, games of observation, almost I spy with my little eye, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, stuff like this, uh, playing games with them. Because when I was a kid, think about thinking back about it most of the games we played were about survival and protection hide yeah, yeah. and seek um i spy you know all these all these little games were actually the same with puppies when puppies play actually they're training for defense or to kill yeah yeah they're, they're practicing <laughs> yeah that's yeah. it it's practice and uh, and that's yeah that's what it should be about just yeah be a be a warrior in the garden that's it, really. Be a warrior yeah. in the garden. You know. Okay. Well, I know you're a busy guy. And um, if anybody wants to contact you, they can um, contact the platform, Critical Performance. So if there's any people looking for close protection operatives or officers or even advice on um, close protection, uh, I'll quite happily put them onto you or you to them. So I know you're a busy guy. So we'll wrap it up there. Unless there's anything else that you wanted to add. Um, we pretty much covered all of the questions that I was going to ask. If I didn't ask the questions, it's because you already answered them without me asking, which is always okay. always a nice thing. Um, but it's been great having you on the podcast, and you're yeah. welcome back uh, later on at any stage. And, yeah, if there's anything you want to add to the conversation that we just had. No, no, it's been fun. Um, yeah, it's been fun. I wish you all the best with the podcast. And uh, I hope it goes from strength to strength. And uh, I look yep. forward to uh, seeing some more episodes with other guests on. And I've I've watched a couple already, and uh, yep. yeah, they're good, they're very good. Yep. So yeah, good luck with everything, mate. Okay, thank you very much, and take care um, when you're doing your protection. And oh yeah, <laughs> <Always>. self preservation. <laughs> That's the, uh, the uh, golden rule: self preservation. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Yep. Okay, take care, sir. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay. See you later, mate. Oops.